Tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video drops. Also at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me live on Twitch where we'll talk about anything and everything in our weekly Q&A stream. Link to join below. And now, on with our feature presentation. This is Minnesota Vikings running back Ricky Young, and he was a very good player for the Vikings for a long period of time. No, he didn't ever make it to a Pro Bowl. And no, he was never in that top tier of running backs in the NFL, like Earl Campbell and Walter Payton. But anyone who watched him play knew how much of an impact he made in Minnesota's offense. After spending three seasons with the San Diego Chargers, when he joined the Vikings in 1978, he immediately contributed by leading the league with 88 receptions, which was the second most in NFL history in a single season at the time only behind Johnny Morris catching 93 passes for the Chicago Bears in 1963. He had a back-to-back -back seasons with over 1,000 yards from scrimmage. And in his entire six-year career in the Twin Cities, the former seventh-round pick scored 24 touchdowns, with some of them, like his two touchdowns and a 14-7 victory against the Detroit Lions in 1979, and his game-winning 14-yard touchdown late in the fourth quarter of the 1982 regular season finale against the Dallas Cowboys on Monday Night Football, being bigger than others. However, of all the 24 touchdowns that he scored, this one might be the craziest one of them all, and one of the strangest touchdowns in the over 60-year history of the Minnesota Vikings. Because in 1982, when the Minnesota Vikings opened up the season against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Ricky Young scored a touchdown that was not designed in the slightest bit. He had no idea what the play was. He lined up in the completely wrong spot, for all intents and purposes, he had no clue as to what exactly he was doing. And yet, he found his way into the end zone in the unlikeliest of fashions. This is the story behind Ricky Young, the 1982 season opener, and what has to be, considering the circumstances, the sloppiest touchdown ever scored by the Minnesota Vikings. Before I talk about the actual touchdown in question, we need some context to understand the importance of this game how the game was going, and how Ricky Young got in the position that he was in. It's September 12, 1982, and it's opening day of a brand new season, and we've got an NFC Central matchup on our hands between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Minnesota Vikings. This is a big game for a few reasons, aside from the fact that it's opening day, and you always want to start the season off on the right foot, especially since last year, 70% of the teams to make the playoffs were 1-0. Number one, it was the first game ever played at the newly built Metrodome, as after spending years at Metropolitan Stadium, the Vikings were moving into a brand new home under a roof. I made a video a while ago about how the Vikings got that stadium built in the first place, so if you want to learn more about that, click the card in the upper right corner. Number two, and perhaps most importantly for the context of the season, there was a strike looming in the distance, so we had no idea how many games were truly going to be played because everyone knew that after Week 2 ended, this could go on for a while. Winning one game in a 16-game season is important, but winning one game in a season that might be significantly less than that? Truly, every game mattered. But to start this game off, Tampa Bay, the reigning champion in the NFC Central, was picking up right where they left off for the majority of last season, and they were doing it by being extremely efficient on third down thanks to the arm of quarterback Doug Williams. On 3rd and 2, to start the drive off, Williams threw a dart over the middle to tight end Jimmy Giles to pick up the first down. As a side note, if you want to learn more about the career of Giles and just how successful he was with Tampa Bay, click the card in the upper right corner. Then, facing 3rd and 5 right near midfield, Williams hit Gerald Carter on a simple crossing pattern over the middle, and Carter did a nice job getting yards after the catch, as he picked up 27 yards on the play as the Bucs were already inside Minnesota's 30-yard line. Even though the Bucs didn't score on the drive, as kicker Bill Capice missed the field goal, Tampa showed that unlike their last game against Minnesota, where they lost 25-10 and only had 193 yards of offense all day, they were actually able to move the ball on this defense. And after Minnesota couldn't get the ball past midfield despite the good field position following the missed field goal, Tampa capitalized, as this time, the Buccaneers were able to get something going. Williams had some big completions to wide receiver Theo Bell, opening the drive with a short pass to him to keep the chains moving, and then finding him wide open over the middle of the field on a 24-yard pass to get past midfield and into Vikings territory for the second straight drive. 
Tampa ended the drive with a 51-yard field goal from Capiz, who atoned for his previous mistake and not only drilled the kick, which was tied for the longest of his NFL career, but gave the Bucks an early 3-0 lead. The two teams then traded punts on the next two drives entering the second quarter. But so far, Minnesota had been unable to move the ball, had been getting stonewalled in many ways, and hadn't even been able to cross midfield. This upcoming drive for the Vikings was monumental, because Minnesota's defense was gassed, and understandably so, from the quick drives from their team and the long drives from the opposition. Don't do something on this drive, and this game might have a chance to get ugly. Fortunately for the Vikings, they were at least looking like they could do it. Facing third down, quarterback Tommy Kramer hit Tony Galbraith for the first down to get the ball rolling. Then, facing third down again, Galbraith leapt over the line for the first down, getting the necessary yardage and once again, using his talent to keep the drive alive. Sure enough, for the third first down of this drive, guess who was the man to convert? You guessed it, Tony Galbraith, who was wide open over the middle of the field and who caught a 23-yard pass to get the Vikings into Tampa territory for the first time all day. A few plays later, and the Vikings were not only inside the red zone, but they were in a goal-to-go situation, thanks to a Kramer pass to Sammy White, who then decided to lateral it to Ahmad Rashad in a bit of an unusual play that didn't quite work out, but was still cool to look at nonetheless. Now, the Vikings had first and goal at the three-yard line. Opportunity was knocking at their doorstep as after stagnating for most of the game, on a drive that they absolutely needed to have to get some momentum and give their defense a much-needed breather, they had a chance to take their first lead of the entire season. As for what followed, prepare yourself for one of the sloppiest touchdowns in the history of the Minnesota Vikings. Before I talk about the touchdown, really quickly, we need to talk about the man who's about to get the ball, Ricky Young. Like I said before, he made some great contributions to the Vikings over his career, but that was in the past. By this point in his career, well, he wasn't exactly getting a whole lot of playing time, as he was buried pretty badly on the depth chart. You had a bunch of guys getting touches over him, especially former first-round pick Ted Brown, who had a whopping 1,757 yards from scrimmage in 1981. And it was only getting worse with the acquisition of running back Darren Nelson in the first round of the 1982 NFL Draft. If you want to learn more about how the Vikings acquired Nelson, and in particular, how Nelson never even wanted to play for the Vikings in the first place, click the card in the upper right corner. Ever since the turn of the decade from the 1970s to the 1980s, Young had been slowly getting phased out of the offensive game plan with Jerry Burns and Bud Grant. Despite his contributions, and with the acquisition of Darren Nelson, it was expected to get even worse. He went from 188 carries in 1979 to 130 in 1980, to just 47 in 1981, despite playing in all 16 games in all three of those seasons. And he went from 260 touches in 1979, to 194 in 1980, to 90 in 1981. Young was sort of the forgotten member of the Vikings offense by this point. And I bring that up because the play you're about to see is literally the first time he was going to touch the ball all season. This was his first chance of the year, to prove himself to a coaching staff that seemingly forgot that they could give him the rock, or knew and just didn't want to. With that in mind, let's see how his first touch of the season went, with 6.31 left in the first half, and how he was going to try and make the most of his opportunity. Roll the tape. From the three-yard line, Kramer now with an audible as he's got Ricky Young and Ted Brown in the backfield. Now, on first glance, you might think that this touchdown doesn't look like anything special. If you're watching this from the outside with absolutely no information whatsoever, what you think happened here is that Young lined up on the left side of the field or the near side of the television screen. Quarterback Tommy Kramer saw something and audible the play to have Young get the handoff from the right side of the field. Heck, even the announcing crew said that Kramer called an audible, and it makes complete sense why they said that, because that's what it looked like. It didn't look like any play out of the ordinary, and it didn't look like a mistake was made on that play. Well, not quite. Because as it turned out, that wasn't an audible at all. That was done 
because Ricky Young literally lined up in the wrong spot. He had no idea where he was supposed to line up, and he completely botched the play. In fact, he had no idea that he was even supposed to get the ball on the play, so he was all out of sorts. Originally, he thought that the ball was going to the other man in the backfield on that play, running back Ted Brown, who was above him on the depth chart. As Young said after the game on that play, I thought I'd be the lead man and block for Teddy. On the sidelines, I watched us use that play a couple times earlier. Our offensive coordinator, Jerry Burns, has some statistics that say like 90% of mixed up plays are not successful. We were fortunate Tommy looked up and saw me. Kramer was incredibly confused when he lined up under center, looked up, and saw Young on the complete wrong side of him, unaware of what he was supposed to be doing and where he was supposed to be. Kramer said on that play, I don't know what happened. I saw him lined up in the wrong position, so I moved him over. So when Kramer turned over to Young for an extended period of time and made that hand signal to move over to the right side, that wasn't an audible. That wasn't anything that Kramer saw in how Tampa's defense was lined up, or in any mismatches on the offensive line that Kramer was trying to exploit, or in any part of the game plan whatsoever. That was Kramer's way of saying to Young, What the heck are you doing? You're supposed to be on the other side of me. You do know this ball is coming to you, right? And Young said after the game on that play, I blew the call and lined up on the wrong side. I guess I was thinking ahead of myself. Tommy called me off just in time. Maybe we should put that play in. It kind of confused the defense, I think. On one hand, Young got his first opportunity of the season, of which there probably would not be a lot of because he was buried on the depth chart now, and he completely blew it by not knowing the play and by not knowing his alignment whatsoever. On the other hand, his confusion confused Tampa Bay, and his confusion led to a critical touchdown to open up the scoring for the Vikings. It was strategic confusion. So I guess it all worked out in the end. And when I say that touchdown was a big one, I truly mean it. And I don't just mean it because it's the answer to the historical question of what players scored the first touchdown ever at the Metrodome. Because from that point on, the Vikings never trailed. That touchdown completely turned the tide. And when the final whistle sounded, in the very first game at the Metrodome, the Vikings were victorious over their NFC Central rival, winning it 17-10. Seven points made the difference, as in, the seven points scored by Ricky Young right around the midway point of the first half. Young set on that touchdown, crediting his blockers, I could have walked that one in almost. Tight end Bob Brewer really made a hell of a block and sprung that play wide open. That play was just what the doctor ordered and was just what the Vikings needed to open up the season on a high note, even if it might have been by complete accident. So what's the moral of the story? Sometimes, it truly is better to be lucky than good, and perhaps no play in the history of the Vikings exhibits that more than Ricky Young's touchdown against the Bucks on opening day of the 1982 season, which was the only rushing touchdown he'd score all season, and was the last rushing touchdown he ever scored in his career. So quite the memorable way to get your only rushing touchdown of the year, and to go out. It seems hard to believe that a player who had no idea what the play was, who had no idea where to line up, who had no idea where to stand, who had no idea where to go, and who had no idea that he was even getting the ball in the first place, could score a touchdown at the highest level of professional football in the world. Yet for Ricky Young, that's exactly what happened. Over his entire nine-year career, Young scored 39 touchdowns. On 38 of them, he knew what he was doing, but perhaps his most memorable was the exception to that rule, where he seemingly scored a touchdown completely by accident. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.